It's one of Scotland's greatest business success stories. Brewdog came in with a new way of presenting what beer was to the general public. The stunts they did, the type of beers they produced, caused headlines. Built on punk principles, attacking the big mainstream beer companies became their mission. <laughs> deserve to die. Future generations will thank us for what's about to go down. What was new was their approach and their willingness not to be part of the establishment. We've built a loyal fan base with more than 200,000 investors, all owning a tiny slice of the Brewdog revolution. I got a Brudo tattoo here, and I got a Brudo tattoo um, right there. Yeah. But is there another side to Brudog and its flamboyant captain? Let's see if I fit. I don't think that leaders should be able to intimidate their staff. He did it at the brewery, and that is a power trip. I felt kind of vulnerable. What do you do when that's your boss? It's like the head of the company. We take a deep dive into Brewdog's turbulent waters. To someone's light. Looks like it to me. Tonight, the truth about Brewdog. Yes, that's genuinely astonishing. I did not know that, no. It's been an impressive rise to the top for Brewdog and its founders, James Watt and Martin Dickey. Since 2007, they've revolutionised the British beer industry, generating tax revenue and thousands of jobs. In 2013, they moved into this state-of-the-art brewery in Ellen in the north of Scotland, and today say they're valued at around two billion pounds. For the staff who joined the journey, it was a roller coaster. People were trying to push the boundaries of what beer was at the time and really actually trying to make things that were really interesting and different. That was part of the appeal, was that you, know, you got a strong sense that no two days would be the same and that they took risks. I think that, that was always a huge part of um, Brewdog's persona, was that they were risk takers. They've gone from scrappy upstarts to the rock stars of craft beer. So how have they done it? Don't worry about the beer, just shout and I phone like an idiot. Ah! Nothing has set Brewdog apart more than its eye-catching marketing campaigns, most of which take digs at mainstream breweries. The company's marketing mayhem is the brainchild of CEO James Watt. I think he's as much of a genius in the world of beer as Tarantino is in the world of film. His bold ideas have made Brewdog impossible to ignore. They haven't been afraid to be really bold in some of the promotions that they've done. I was very taken with the idea of having young and fun people around the industry. People who kind of wanted to shake up the old pale male and stale category. They took a pop at London's bankers by dropping taxidermied fat cats over the city. They even stuffed the world's strongest beer into roadkill. If you want an insight into the mind of Brewdog's captain, his book's a good place to start. And it's a really fun and engaging read, full of great advice, like don't listen to advice and be selfish and don't bother learning from your mistakes because that's for losers. It also says, though, that if you want to grow a brand like Brewdog, you've got to be open and honest because, according to this, everything is marketing. And audiences are savvy and they're quick to smell the marketing BS. With that in mind, we thought we'd put Brewdog's marketing to the test. Just how open and honest has the company been over the years? Brewdog was born, the story goes, after an encounter with famed beer writer Michael Jackson. Mm, not that one. Oh my goodness, it's Michael Jackson tasting a beer that we made at home. He tasted it, 
kind of put the glass down and looked at us quite sternly and just said, boys, quit your jobs and start making beer. Curiously, James is not in this photograph of the famous meeting. Was he even there? We don't think so, but Brewdog won't tell us. No harm done. But is there a smell around some of the company's greatest marketing hits? Take this one, for example. In 2019, they brewed a beer at 30,000 feet. What you have in your glass is the first ever beer made on an aeroplane. Yes! Or did they? We spoke to one of the people who actually made that beer, who told us this was all a stunt and the beer had in fact been brewed in Ellen. Brewdog deny this. So what about the employee who put an obscene term on the bottom of 200,000 cans and instead of being sacked, he was made a hero? The whole thing was just made up. There was no employee of the month scheme at Brewdog. He was handed a bit of A4 paper that said employee of the month, which I printed off. I took the picture and then he went back to his job. You took that picture? Yeah, the whole thing was a setup. Ah, just a bit of fun. Out of all their marketing stories, I like this one the best, Elvis Juice. It's a grapefruit flavoured pale ale and one of Brewdog's best sellers. It's actually my favourite as well. This is me trying my first ever pint of it six months ago. After its launch, Elvis Presley's estate made a copyright claim against Brewdog. But James and Martin knew just what to do. The pair proudly changed their names by deed poll to Elvis, as they explained in this BBC documentary from 2020. I was Elvis Watt. Originally, everyone in the company was going to change their name, but then when we got the forms and paperwork in, everyone chickened out except myself and Martin. They even posted pictures of the official deed poll forms online. Right, I loved this story when I first heard it, but... For the past century, any changes of name by deed poll must be registered with the London Gazette. Now, the Gazette is now online, so we can check. There's no sign of James or Martin ever changing their names by deed poll. It only exists here in Brewdog's marketing world. Well, and also here in Forbes magazine. And here in this piece in the Herald. And here in this BBC documentary. Brewdog told us there was no intention to deceive anyone and that under Scots law, you don't have to fill out a deed poll form to change your name. Ah, well, I guess it's all just a bit of fun for the bad boys of beer. Anyway, Brewdog 2022 is a little bit different. Brewdog makes beer, but it's not just beer for laughing hipsters or cliched father-son moments. You're a man now. The Beer for All campaign is part of Brewdog's new image. Outwardly, they're less punk and a bit more, well, Coldplay. That's why we're the planet's favourite beer. They say sustainability is their priority and they're now the world's first carbon negative brewery. They've raised millions from crowdfunding to install a biogas unit and other planet saving measures at their facility in Ellen. All while James charged the company up to £4,000 an hour to fly around on a private jet. Did you know, by the way, a private jet flight is 10 times more carbon intensive than a normal flight? Ach, but who's counting? Their flagship sustainability plan is planting trees. It just hit us like an absolute sledgehammer, this blindingly stark realisation that we weren't doing nearly, nearly enough. They've called it the Lost Forest. And look, their website said right here they'll plant a tree there for every pack of lost lagers sold. We are causing this carbon to go in the air, so we want to take responsibility, we want to own this, and we want to fix it ourselves. Now, I've bought quite a bit of lost lager in the last six months, so I'm looking forward to seeing the forest I've helped to pay for. And here it is, the Kinrara Estate, home to the Lost Forest. Or at least it will be a forest once Brewdogs start planting trees here. There's a reason why there aren't many trees here yet. 
Brewdog aren't planning to pay for them with their own cash. Last year, we were contacted by an anonymous source inside the Scottish Government. They wanted us to know that Brewdog had recently submitted a grant application to pay for the planting of trees here at the Lost Forest. The application is for up to £1.3 million to cover the cost of phase one of their tree planting plan. Brewdog say they've spent £10 million on buying the land. Now, let's be clear, planting trees is a great idea and great for the environment. But it doesn't look like it'll be paid for by Brewdog from the sales of Lost Lager. Victor Clements is an advisor and campaigner on native woodlands in Scotland. Anyone planting trees in Scotland will apply to the first year grant scheme. I don't think anybody objects to using public money for planting woodlands, but you know, if you want to allocate credit for it, then actually, you know, we are paying for that. We, the taxpayer. Correct, yeah. There's a lot of presentation on these things, isn't there? Maybe the PR department is spending a bit too much. Because remember, whether it's taking on Elvis or saving the planet, everything is marketing, even if it has an occasional whiff of BS. Brewdog have told us the forestry grant scheme is open for anyone to apply and anticipates that 1.1 million trees will be planted in the lost forest. The company says it has always been clear they're planting trees in two locations and Brewdog has a dedicated area where trees are planted in an Eden Forest project in Madagascar. Harmless marketing fun or not, the gimmicks and the punk stick it to the man attitude have been hugely successful in creating a legion of Brewdog fans. James Watt and Martin Dickey have harnessed that fan base loyalty to help grow the company beyond what was thought possible. This is something much bigger than an intelligent investment. We're buying into an ideal, a philosophy, a vision. This is a cool gig. Let's rock it out together. In 2009, the company launched its Equity for Punks crowdfunder. Brewdog lovers were offered the chance to invest in the company. Those fans of the brewer were able to buy a stake, a slice of the company. But in return, uh, they would also get promotions on beer, uh, members of the club. It was almost like a loyalty scheme as well. As we continue to grow, so will the value of your investment. You will literally become richer with every beer you drink. The company has now run seven rounds of EFP, raising more than 100 million quid from fans. This is equity for punks. Phil is one of them. Hi, Phil. Hiya. This is where your brew dog journey began. Yeah, I invested in the round that got this, this bar open. Phil first invested in 2011 and has ventured more of his cash over the years. What was it that was attractive about this company? It was just it's a bit different. The, uh, the beer was, was like tasted like kind of fresher, tasted better than what I'd been drinking before. Brewdog was like anti-corporate, it was anti-big beer. Exactly. Wasn't it? And is yes. that one of, the, one of the attractions? Definitely. I've been brought up to look local, look small, support, support small companies. Do you mind me asking how much you invested? Over the years, probably about three and a half thousand. Phil's one of more than 200,000 investors, each owning a slice of the punk revolution. And here he is with the CEO himself. The EFP community is full of just fantastic people. I've got so many friends that I've made over the years just because Brewdog existed. Equity for Punks is one of the world's most successful crowdfunding schemes and is key to Brewdog's success. Time for me to get involved. Looks like I am just in time because the most recent Brewdog Equity for Punks share issue ends in just one day. So I can buy two shares for £50.30. and pence. I can buy 200 shares for £5,030. So that means shares are working out at £25.15p each. OK, just like that, that's me a punk. And in return for buying a 
bit at the company, you get numerous benefits. I will get a lifetime discount in our bars and online shop. That's 5%. I get a free beer on my birthday every year. I get an invite to their infamous AGMs for me and a friend. I get a badge, an Equity for Punks badge. Ah, and I get my own tree planted in the new Brewdog Forest for 50 quid. That's all right, isn't it? I'm now one of the 70,000 new EFPs who've lobbed in a total of 30 million pounds in the last 18 months. At 25 pounds a share, that would make the company worth a whopping 1.8 billion. A valuation Brewdog says is backed by a managing director from Goldman Sachs. However, it isn't just the punks who own Brewdog. In 2017, Less than two years after dropping fat cats on the city of London, Brewdog sold nearly a quarter of the company to private equity firm TSG for more than 200 million. You've got to get into bed with somebody and ultimately when one looks at the growth that Brewdog have achieved after the TSG investment, it's given them everything they wanted. That expansion with control where they're still the majority shareholders in terms of James and Martin has been largely positive. I guess your investment's sitting quite pretty at the moment. I checked yesterday, actually. At the moment, it's sitting at a 15 times return for what was purchased back in 2011. Not bad. And James and Martin did pretty well out of it too. While the punks can only sell a fraction of their shares on special trading days, the anti-fat cat co-founders sold a pile of theirs to TSG and raked in nearly a hundred million quid between them. The pair had become stupendously rich, but pretty soon, the company wanted another cash injection. So what did they do? Hang on, let's check the punk business bible again. Here it is, page 82, brace yourselves. Why spend your own money when you can spunk someone else's? Our business is part owned by over 50,000 people who love good beer as much as we do. Another crowdfunder. The future won't be dictated to us by mega corporations, but shaped by people like you and us. I felt that was a kick in the teeth. Basically got massive amounts of investment, taking some money out for themselves and, and, and then asking other people to put more money back in again. Why? This crowdfunding round cost ordinary punks 23 quid a share. That's a ten or more, by the way, than TSG paid per share. And that's probably the point where I started to drift away from loving Brewdog as a brand. Like, meh, just move on. Some investors, like Phil, lost faith, but others got stuck in. In fact, the majority of Brewdog's 200,000 punks have signed up since the TSG deal. And here's why. Look, all the lines are going up. I wonder how many paid close attention to bullet point three in the risk section, which warns, in the event that the company's entire capital is returned to the shareholders, or if the company is wound up, the C shareholders will be entitled to a sum equal to the greater of A, that which they would receive were all shares in the company to be ranked paro passu, and B, their subscription price plus an 18% compound annual return on that subscription price for the period from the issue to the point at which capital was returned. Wait, what? So what happened when TSG bought in is a new type of share was created called C-class shares, and these had special rights that don't apply to the other shareholders. Um, the BC shares are entitled to make a guaranteed return of 18% a year. 18% a year? Preference shares aren't uncommon. 18% a year is expensive by most market rates. But that is unusual, notable, I would say. Brewdog is expected to list its shares in the stock market soon in what's known as an Initial Public Offering, or IPO. This is the point where ordinary investors might hope to see a return on the cash they've invested. But that can only happen if Brewdog's market value at the time of the IPO at least covers the very high return that's been promised to the private equity investors at TSG. If the TSG 18% a year growth isn't delivered by the Brewdog share price, then they will receive a larger chunk of the business, so that money is going to come from other shareholders. Equity punks. Like and me. the founders, but equity punks, yes. If you were 
planning to become uh, one of the latest equity punks, it really would have uh, been wise to look at the previous deals uh, that BrewDog had struck with the private equity partners. If the company were to float tomorrow, it would need to be valued at around two billion for most punks to see a return. You can see scenarios where BrewDog struggles to be worth a billion pounds um, at IPA. Um, and, and BrewDog have made not, not implausible suggestions that they could be worth more, well, closer to two billion, if not slightly more. Um, both of those are possible, um, but certainly neither of them are guaranteed. BrewDog say they're committed to floating the company. The longer they wait, the more TSG is owed. The more TSG is owed, the more they'll have to grow. But with plans to open 30 new bars this year, anything's possible. So, just to sum up, James Watt and Martin Dickey sold nearly a quarter of the company to TSG, effectively guaranteeing their investment over Equity Punk's investments like mine, made nearly 100 million quid between them in the process, and six months later, launched another round of crowdfunding asking their loyal fans for yet more money. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. I guess it's just good business. And as for my investment, I'll still get a beer on my birthday. <coughs> Brewdog say that in setting its most recent valuation, they've taken advice from two of the world's most prestigious investment banks. And they say last year they received an investment proposal valuing the company at 1.8 billion. Since the TSG deal, James Watt's personal business empire has expanded and we found out about some investments that James Watt would probably rather be kept quiet. For example, in 2017, he invested more than £2 million in a hedge fund in the Cayman Islands, one of the world's most secretive offshore tax havens. But here's another that will really take your breath away. First, a bit of context. We've heard all about how James feels about big beer companies. In fact, James Watt has taken aim at other craft brewers for selling out to the corporate giants Brewdog stands against. Here, in 2015, he tells the world his bars would no longer stock Lagunitas after they were bought out by Heineken. In 2018, he punished Beavertown Craft Brewery for selling a stake of their company to Heineken. Well, get a load of this. We found out that in 2017, James Watt bought shares worth half a million pounds in that insipid corporate giant, the scourge of the craft beer industry that he claims to despise, Heineken. Take that, Heineken. You weren't expecting that, were you? Would it surprise you to know that James Watt is a shareholder in Heineken. <laughs> yes, that's... Oh, yes, that's genuinely astonishing. I did not know that, no. To the tune of, you know, at least £500,000 worth of shares James, is part of James Watt's private portfolio. Oh. Yeah, you've got me there, that's... No, I, I didn't know that. Does it matter, though? It's his own money. Yeah, he's, he's allowed it. to invest in whoever he wants. Does it matter? None of those things do matter unless that's what you're growing your business uh, off the back of. So if you say that we fundamentally disagree with the principles of multinational macro lager breweries and you build a community around you and hundreds of thousands of people invest in you and what you believe, you've got to live that like every day in everything you do, it, that should be reflected. James Watt has told us his tax arrangements are entirely legal and legitimate, and he pays tax on all income, both overseas and in the UK. He didn't respond to our Heineken discovery. Brewdog's rapid growth has created thousands of jobs across the world. 
In the last six months, we've spoken to nearly 100 current and former BrewDog employees. Many have told us that behind the company's public image lies a toxic work culture. And that culture, we've been told, was particularly toxic for women. Charlotte Cook, who worked for BrewDog for three years, has said she experienced regular misogyny at her job in the brewery. I think BrewDog definitely had the most blokey and laddish atmosphere that I've worked in. It can be quite aggressively sort of sexualized as well. So these are your colleagues? Yeah. And I mean, how often would, how often would this happen? Every day. Yeah. Well, every day there would be male colleagues making sexualized comments t towards you? Um, pretty much. How, how did that make you feel? Uncomfortable. It's not what you want when you go into work. Um, but it was so kind of uh, ingrained into what people were doing. Charlotte Cook left BrewDog seven years ago. We've also heard more recent claims of discriminatory practices. In 2017, Alice Hayward was working in bars when she was asked by her seniors to go for a promotion. At her job interview, she revealed she was in a relationship. And they just kind of fixated on that and um, just stopped asking me any questions about my experience or my beer knowledge and started asking me questions about this relationship and how long it had been and whether I thought I was going to marry them and then um, asked me about having kids. And I had said that I didn't want them. I've never wanted kids. Um, so... They asked next. you whether you were planning to have kids? Yeah. They asked me that and I was just kind of like, um, no, I don't want them, so <laughs> not a thing. Next question. How did that make you feel? It was kind of like a, like a few days afterwards and I was just like, hang on, this isn't... that wasn't OK. Alice Hayward told her manager about it and complained on grounds of sex discrimination. She says her complaint was not upheld. Last summer, a small group of former BrewDog employees, calling themselves punks with purpose, wrote an open letter to the company and to James Watt. In it, they detail allegations of misogyny, bullying, lying, summary dismissals and a toxic workplace culture. In the months since, over 300 current and former staff have signed the letter. Rob Mackay is one of the founding members. There was absolutely a culture of fear. I personally witnessed someone being called into a meeting, uh, coming out 10 minutes later and announcing that they'd just been removed from the business. Um, uh, that was pretty shocking and horrible. I came back 10 minutes later and joked, oh, has anyone else left? You know, are we missing anyone else? And it transpired that, yes, someone else had been let go in, you know, in the space in the 10 minutes that I'd not been there and they'd already left the, the premises. That person was Scott Fife. He was in the marketing team and said as far as he knew, he'd been doing well. We had a planning meeting that morning where we were discussing what, whatever I was working on that week. And then the HR department asked me to come upstairs to a, a meeting room. And then I was told that my job didn't exist anymore, that I wasn't going to be needed, that I had done a great job uh, and that I would be given my notice. I asked, why does my job no longer exist? And I was told that I didn't need to concern myself with that, that I had 10, 15 minutes to pack up my desk and that I would be escorted from the building. I was in shock. I burst into tears. Um, my colleagues had no idea what was going on. People were coming up and asking what was going on. And I was trying to explain, but I didn't really know. And then I think three or four months later, uh, I saw that they were advertising for my job. How did that make you feel? It's difficult to get closure on that. Uh, I was angry and raw for a very long time after that happened because I just didn't know why. I had no idea why. I, I, I never found out the reason why. After the Punks With Purpose letter was published, James Watt said that the comments from former staff were hard to hear. There were hundreds of signatories on there. If as he says, as the captain with a good ship brew dog, 
that the buck stops with him, how has he only just found out about this? None of it should have come as a surprise. This wasn't the first time Brewdog staff had raised concerns. We found out that in 2019, Brewdog carried out an all-staff survey to try and gauge staff morale. These are the findings, and they're not good. Staff felt there was a lack of consideration for their well-being and mental health. When head office staff were asked if they'd recommend Brewdog as a place to work, it scored minus 54. This survey should have been a wake-up call for the company, but we've been told that the results were not shared with staff and the conclusions were not acted on. Brewdog said it took culture issues raised in the Punks with Purpose letter extremely seriously, and James Watt offered a full and frank apology. The company took immediate actions, including launching an ethics hotline, a salary review and an independent culture review. The review highlighted the need to do more to support staff and has led to measures designed to improve leadership. He's been given an MBE from the Queen and is lauded in Scotland. James Watt wanted to do something no other British craft brewery had done before, to crack America. I've arrived in the US in the week that the company opened its eighth American bar, this time in Cleveland, Ohio. Hi guys, Kevin. Hey. I'm here to meet Brewdog super fans and EFP shareholders, Kevin and Kelsey Groover. Let's go have a okay. beer. Thank you very much. All right. Looking forward to it. They're here for an EFP event the night before the bar opens. I got a Brudo tattoo here, and I got a, I got a Brudo tattoo um, right there. Yeah. Um, I, I put tattoos on me that kind of like impacts my, my life along the way. He won that know? one. Yeah, I did win this one. Uh, we, there was a drawing. Um, you can win a free tattoo. And I already had one, but I was like, oh, I'll get another one. You, know? <laughs> you got a free tattoo from Brudo? Yeah, they give away free tattoos, yeah, uh, from time to time, yeah. All right. In a, in a little contest, yeah. And plus, if you have a tattoo, you get like 20% uh, off on all beers or merch or uh, food. So that's a good perk to have as well. You got, you got one too, oh, can yeah, you show right. me? Right here. To the bitter end. The okay. original BrewDog logo. Okay. And then I just put to the bitter end because I'll be a supporter until the bitter end. So, I mean, you, you guys, do you guys love BrewDog? We do. Yes, we do, absolutely. It's not necessarily like the liquid, in, you know, the liquid that's coming out of food. It's like the community and the, and the, and the people um, that are passionate about craft beer as much as we are, for sure. And so did, did you have a brew dog wrap? I did. I did a brew... I did do a brew dog wrap. Can you give us a couple of lines now? Just a couple of lines? Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> brew tiny batches filled bottles by hand, man. So beers to markets at the back of the van. And 08 is when they started to roll, getting lit by the content of Tokyo. And if you all don't know, 09's the year. You can first buy shares in brew dog beer. 2010, AGM, begin to dominate in a tank on Camden. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Bravo. Yeah, yeah, Bravo. Yeah. I, I, said, I wasn't expecting to be wrapped too right. when I arrived here today, but that yeah. was wonderful. Yeah, thank that you. That was wonderful. After meeting Kevin and Kelsey, I think I understand a bit more about Brewdog and its punters. It's more than just about the beer. It's a community, and it's growing rapidly. With bars across America's Midwest, the Scottish upstarts are expanding across the pond in a big way. Ohio has a rich brewing history and is fast becoming one of America's craft beer heartlands. There are over 300 breweries in the state, with dozens more opening every year. I wanted to learn more about how Brewdog ended up in the sleepy town of Canal Winchester, just outside Columbus. So I'm meeting J.D. Malone, he was a business reporter for a local paper when Brewdog first rolled into town. Yeah, how long did you work there? I worked there for about five years. Okay. It must have been amazing walking into work every day with that. What brought them to Canal Winchester? Was there lots of incentives 
Oh, well, I think they got a sweetheart the... deal, of course. I mean, they, they get, definitely got a sweetheart deal. I think there, were, there, were, there was over $3 million in incentives from the city, um, tax incentives, and various other incentives, I think, for utilities. A place like Canal Winchester, that's probably the biggest thing that's happened there in 20 years. So part of my job was to look at them a little more closely. And there were, <laughs> there were a lot of stories coming out of BrewDog. Um, not a lot of people who would go on the record, not a lot of people who wanted their name associated with the stories that they were telling about BrewDog. Um, but very early on, there was a lot of stuff about maybe this wasn't what anybody thought it was, or maybe they didn't present themselves exactly the way they actually did business. Rumor was that BrewDog's rapid growth here was causing problems similar to those reported by staff in the UK. There are now eight bars across three states, with two more planned in the next year. For staff who wanted to be part of the BrewDog revolution, it seemed like a dream job. The thing that drew me in to go work for BrewDog was their culture. They were known for having amazing culture. You get healthcare, you get all these benefits that not a lot of people in the industry get. They make it sound like it's just this amazing company and it's the, they want to make it the best company to work for. A brewery that was really committed to everyone enjoying craft beer, to creating community, to putting the voice of their beer drinkers at the like, forefront of what they did. But for some BrewDog USA staff we've spoken to, that dream turned into a nightmare. People were having panic attacks, people were crying behind the building. I spent basically the whole summer that we were open uh, with hypertension. I was getting nosebleeds, but they would last for 20 minutes. So my stress levels were really, really high. People got fired so quickly working there, like drop of a hat, somebody's gone. And it was basically like, if you don't prove yourself quick enough, you will get fired. That was the culture. Was that the kind of brew dog that you thought you were joining? Not at all. Some believe this culture came from the very top. There was absolutely a culture of fear surrounding interactions with James. If you didn't give him the answer you wanted, you constantly feared, is your job going to suffer? Are you going to have a job after you talk to him? For all of the really cool and interesting and like brilliant things James Watt did, what he's turned into to me is a person who thrives on fear and chaos and being in control. So you're all terrified of this guy? Yes, yes, terrified. I am scared during this interview. <laughs> in 2016, soon after BrewDog had set up in Ohio, questions about its operations began to surface. This was a company in a hurry. Despite delays to construction, their first AGM was to be held in September, and their US flagship Dog Tap Bar was due to open a few months later. Problem was, though, that the brewery wasn't yet operational, and so for the first few months, all of the brew dog beer that was being sold in here had to come from Scotland. Shipping beer to the US isn't straightforward. It has to be approved by agents from a branch of the US Treasury, any unusual ingredients in the beer, such as flavourings or extracts, have to be declared. Back in Ellen, this was causing issues. Staff there knew some beers, including Elvis juice, used certain extracts that weren't at the time approved in the States. They say that senior management pressured them to flout rules and get the beer to the US in time, no matter what. Three have agreed to speak to us anonymously. It was made clear by the quality team that the Elvis juice extracts were not approved for import to the US. It was a case of just find a way around the rules to get this selection of beers to the US on time. People were often fired without explanation in BrewDog. Everyone was worried they'd be next if they didn't do what was being asked of them. Our evidence reveals BrewDog withheld the information. These are the documents for Elvis Juice and Jet Black Heart submitted to the US Alcohol and Tobacco Trade Bureau, the TTB. They show no extracts were declared. We've shown our findings to former TTB agent, Battle Martin. 
We've obtained the ingredient sheet that was being used at that time mm -hmm. in 2016. Okay. If you just take a closer look at this ingredient sheet, what do you see there? I see natural grapefruit extracts, grapefruit extracts, it's like orange extract. These are extracts. If those extracts were being added to that product, a formula should have been submitted by the importer. So someone's lied. Looks like it to me. And that means, does it? Not that hundreds of kegs of Elvis juice were illegally shipped to the US. Looks like it. Yeah. It looks like that was what happened. So the Elvis juice and Jet Black Heart sold at the company's AGM in September 2016 and at the flagship Dog Tap Bar for four months in 2017 were shipped illegally from the UK. While we're at it, they never bothered getting any approval for this beer, Blitz Gin, also on sale illegally at the AGM. But I guess it is pretty punk. And like James says in his book, So street rules, regulations and bureaucrats with the callous indifference they deserve. The consequences of not getting permission are almost never as bad as you think. The TTB has told us it couldn't comment on specifics, but said there is a three-year statute of limitation for offences, and that enforcement action could not have been taken against Brewdog in any case because they're a foreign company. Instead, it's the domestic importer whose licence would have been on the line. Daniel Shelton was Brewdog's importer in September 2016. Can you confirm whether these extracts were declared to your company? Um, certainly weren't. We believed what we were told and we weren't told what was actually going on. You submitted this form in good faith, but it turns out that they deceived you and you submitted false information to a US, to a US government agency. How do you feel about that? Well, obviously, um, I, I'm unhappy about that. I would be angry about that, especially if it leads to any real investigation. Last week, James Watt said he regretted they had taken shortcuts in the importation process. He said there had been technical inaccuracies in their paperwork and that they had self-reported the issues to the TTB. Brewdog added it had never sought to evade tax and had never used illegal ingredients in their beer. Brewdog say they're working hard to change the culture of the company. They've introduced a new workplace code which says it wants staff to feel comfortable and safe at work. But we've been told that in the very recent past, some Brewdog staff have felt anything but. And the allegations centre on the captain of the ship himself, James Watt. Meg Herman has told us about something she said she saw in 2017 at the Dog Tap in Canal Winchester. We were off shift and James was in town and a couple of us were sitting around the fire pit. He was very flirtatious with uh, an employee at that point and he ends up going up to the roof with her and no one on staff that was downstairs felt comfortable with it. I think it is so unprofessional. I mean, a private life is someone's private life. And the thing is he brought it into his business. He could have gone anywhere else but he didn't. He did it at the brewery. And that is a power trip. Brewdog sacked Meg Herman for theft in 2019. She says she'd taken a six pack of damaged beer and says there was an understanding staff were allowed to drink unsellable stock. Won't Brewdog say she's dishonest? This is her getting her own back at Brewdog. They're gonna say whatever they wanna say about me. I honestly think that they looked for any reason to get rid of me because they did not like that I started questioning things. So what do you hope to achieve by speaking here today? I think that I would like to advocate for anybody that is in a hostile work environment, such as BrewDog, or, you know, they work for BrewDog, and show them that this is not acceptable behavior and somebody needs to be held accountable for it. James Watt told us that he has never been on the roof of the dog tap, either on his own or accompanied by anyone. This isn't the only story we've heard from former staff about James Watt taking a woman to the roof of a Brewdog building. 
Hayden Beer was assistant manager at the company's Franklinton premises in Columbus. Well, there was one time that he came in with two women. Uh, it was it was later in the night. He came right up to the bar, had me pour them drinks. They were already drunk when they came in. Eventually, he left with one of those two women to go up to the entrance to like a roof bar area, and then uh, proceeded to 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 kiss this lady uh, while her friend was just downstairs waiting. So he was he was making out upstairs. Yeah, he was making out with her. And how do you know that he, he was making out with this woman upstairs if you were downstairs? Well, he was on camera. Uh, you and other members of staff saw the CEO of BrewDog in the roof bar making out with a drunk customer. Yeah, not like in the roof bar itself, but yeah, on the roof area. In the roof terrace. Yeah, exactly. With a drunk customer that he brought in. It was already inebriated when they showed up. Sometimes it did feel as though he treated coming to the US as his uh, vacations. Check on the bar, like you'd check on the bars, but it did feel kinda sometimes like he would just do whatever he wanted to in the US. Hayden Beer wasn't the only BrewDog employee there that night. I've spoken to Nathan Quick. I saw this through the video camera with my own eyes. He was on the rooftop uh, kissing with his hand up the shirt of this young lady. It wasn't uncommon for us to have the perception that that was going on, but for us to physically see it on the camera was, was something else. What did you think of this, Nathan? <laughs> Inappropriate. Can I tell you that James Watt has emphatically denied ever having any sexual encounter on a roof? Well, I would say it was a lie unless he considers the rooftop patio not technically a roof, but I would say that that was a bald, bald-faced lie. James Watt said at no time did he have a sexual encounter on the roof terrace of the Franklinton Bar. His lawyer says they have a statement from the only party that could have been present, and she says she did visit the roof briefly with him, was not intoxicated, and says absolutely no sexual encounter took place. We've spoken to more than a dozen BrewDog USA staff who've told us they felt uncomfortable with how James Watt acted around women in BrewDog bars. Caitlin Ising worked at BrewDog for two years. Sometimes there'd be one woman, sometimes there, there would be a gaggle of women. They were always intoxicated. They were in their 20s, usually. They were very pretty. Um, and he would say he's taking them on a private tour of the brewery. You're the owner of a company. We're looking for to you to set the standard. You know, he's setting that standard for us, and it's not a good example. Jackie English was a duty manager at the flagship bar in Canal Winchester until last year. She says she witnessed James Watt doing similar things. There were three separate nights that I can think of spread out throughout the time that I was there when I was closing and I did see him come into the building with a girl, a young female, you know, cute little blondes. <laughs> and he would take them into the brewery to give them a tour or whatever. Yeah, it was just odd, <laughs> a bit uncomfortable. It made you feel uncomfortable? It did make me feel uncomfortable. Do you think it's appropriate? No, especially not walking them in front of your employees. Like you're showing your employees that you can do whatever you want because of who you are and who your name is. That's how it felt a lot of times. James Watt denies the allegation. He says he regularly takes both women and men on evening tours of the brewery, and it's not true they are intoxicated. His lawyer says a claim made by an employee in 2021 was investigated by an external HR service and was not substantiated. James Watt's alleged behaviour around women was a talking point amongst managers across a number of BrewDog bars. Danny Campbell joined the company as the manager of its Indianapolis bar when it opened in 2019. At her first manager's meeting, she says she was told to watch out for James Watt. We were all in a room getting ready before 
uh, James showed up or we all got to meet him. Um, and one of the managers just glossed over like, hey, these are the plans for the day. And he said, also, you're James's type. So if he walks into a room, you should leave the room. Don't be in a room alone with him. And then just went on going about the regular plans for the event. What did you think when you heard that? that that's kind of a messed up thing to put on an employee. But also I was super new there and just said, OK. And this piece of advice then, that did it stick with you? A hundred percent, yeah. That definitely stuck with me. So before he came into town, I gave my staff kind of a quick chat and just said, hey, these are rumors we have heard. If you don't feel comfortable working when he's here, let me know. Um, if I'm not on the schedule, I will be here within 20 minutes and I will do my best to be stuck to his side while he is here. So you're effectively coaching your staff on how to handle James Watt yes. in terms of any potential inappropriate behaviour? Correct. More than a dozen staff have told us that female workers would be advised on how to act when James Watt was in town. We would make a point to warn new girls and warn the host, like, hey, just so you know, James Watt's coming to town. Just kind of like leave after your shift. Don't really hang around. Don't always do your hair and makeup that day. Like, don't catch his attention. And you did that? Oh, definitely. We all did. Some managers say they took extra steps to help female staff who felt uncomfortable when James Watt was around. I would schedule certain female staff around him not being, so they would not be there. I would schedule a lot of more men at nights when he was there. I would sit at the bar, behind the bar, with female staff so they wouldn't feel uncomfortable. They had another male presence there, so it wasn't just James. To them, they just want, don't even want him to be there. Dylan, who worked at the Franklinton Bar for three years, said there was one woman James Watt had been paying special attention to. We'd be sitting at, like, let's say, like this end of the bar or whatever, and he would be just staring. I mean, just like, just staring. I mean, staring at an employee over and over again every time you visit, asking if she's working. And she would ask you not to work on the, on the days that James was going to be there? If, if I could avoid it, I would try. If I knew he was coming in and she was working, I would, I would be up there with her or made sure another staffer, whether it was a man or a woman, was with her because I knew she would feel uncomfortable. How did you feel about the fact that this was what you felt you had to do. It didn't make me feel good. To have someone who is your captain to make you feel that way, just that shouldn't be how it is. You know, it's, it was disappointing. And I'm, I'm more or less disappointed in myself that I couldn't make something happen sooner. You didn't feel you could speak out about it then? I would have been canned long ago. We make no allegations of criminality with women against James Watt. But bar managers claiming they had to shield their staff from their CEO is a serious claim. I needed to get this woman's side of the story. I spoke to her on the phone. She asked us not to use her name. He was a starer. He liked to stare, you know, trying to make conversation with me, which is fine. I mean, no big deal. Um, at one point, took my Instagram and posted on it and followed himself on it. Uh, so then I started kind of getting a little bit more of a uncomfortable vibe. You were being singled out for more attention than the others. Yes. And how did this make you feel? Just uncomfortable. I just wanted to leave, not really deal with it. With a customer, for example, you can tell them no or you can cut them off of their alcohol, or you can even escalate it to a manager who would kick them out. What do you do when that's your boss? It's like the head of the company. You can't really tell them no or cut them off. You feel a little bit powerless. Mr. Watt says at no time has he given unwelcome attention to any female bartender. His lawyer said, following inquiries by Brewdog, none of the managers interviewed had any knowledge of staff attempting to swap shifts to avoid Mr. Watt.
each of the people we've met so far has left Brewdog, but we've also spoken to current staff. Some say they are afraid to speak for fear of losing their jobs. One current employee is willing to speak publicly. Kayla McGuire works in the brewery in Ohio. I don't think that uh, leaders should be able to intimidate their staff. I don't think anyone should have to go to work and be afraid of what's going to happen to them, um, especially not in an industry that should be joyful and fun and creative. Beer is for everybody, and it has to be everybody, not just the people who are in charge. What would you say to people who might say these are, you know, disgruntled ex-employees? What, what would you say to that um, point? I will, would wonder why so many of us are disgruntled employees or ex-employees. I would say if you're not seeing any evidence, um, you haven't asked the right people or looked hard enough, those allegations have made many of us uncomfortable, myself included. What has made you decide to do this then, Kayla? Um, I love my job. I love the people that I work with. And no matter what, I want the people that I work with to have a safe place to work. Since we've been here in the US, there's been a real groundswell of people wanting to come forward. More and more former and current staff members have sought us out to tell us their experiences at BrewDog. In particular, women who've told us about how James Watt made them feel unsafe at work, uncomfortable, that he'd abused his position of power. And all of these things raise really serious questions for James Watt. James Watt declined to be interviewed. BrewDog chairman Alan Layton said he'd been provided with assurances by Mr. Watt the allegations were not accurate and based in rumour and misinformation. He added, James has committed to making improvements to his management style. As BrewDog reaches a critical point in its expansion, there are questions over whether James Watt remains the right person to captain the ship. You know, they started next to uh a fishery brewing beer, you know, people believed in them and brought them to where we are now. You left those people to the wayside and just kept going, kept going, kept going, and kept going, and now your culture is shattered. I mean, you're, to me, the ship is sinking. I appreciate what the place could be, but it needs to come to light that it is a facade and there is someone in charge there who is abusing his power and shouldn't be leading that place. So many people that work there just deserve better. And I know that there's a lot of people who have thrived there and have been very successful, but my message is just that I hope that these stories can actually cause some sort of internal change. I'm not here to say that it's a terrible place. I'm just saying do better. Do better. <laughs> Investigating how antisocial behaviour blights communities across Britain and discovering how hard it can be to get help. Panorama, Afraid in My Own Home, is tonight at 10.35, here on BBC One Scotland.